you for joining us on Zoom and those that are listening on Facebook Live. I hope you and your family are healthy and safe. Um, we wish we could be gathered in person, but alas, we are here together by Zoom. Um, I would urge you to uh, view today, tonight's program on speaker view, and also if you have questions, to post them in the chat. I want to thank our sponsors tonight and Citizens United and Let America Vote, as well as Larry and Jane Armstrong, Jeff and Martha Clark, um, Cynthia Muse, Bob Perry, John and Mary Rao, and Bobby Sweet. We are so grateful for all of your support. Those of you who walked with our founder, Granny D, and others of you who have walked with us and the New Hampshire Rebellion now over 40,000 miles for democracy. Um, we also thank the members of our regional teams that are join us weekly to take meaningful actions to advance democracy reform. We together can advance our honest elections and clean government package in New Hampshire and federally uh, the HR1 package. Together we can end the influence of big money um, by passing public funding at the federal level and advancing it at the state level. We can pass redistricting reform and ensure that the districts that are drawn next year will be drawn in a fair and transparent process. We will keep fighting to restore voting rights. And so together we will fix our democracy. And I wanna introduce former Congresswoman Carol Shea Porter, the chair of Open Democracy's advisory board to introduce tonight's guest speaker. Thank you very much. And I am absolutely delighted to be here. And I'm especially appreciative of being able to introduce my friend, Congressman John Sarbanes. John Sarbanes and I came into office together in January of 2007. We actually served on a couple of committees together, education and uh, labor. And we obviously both care deeply about working men and women in this country and natural resources and that's been an interest of John's all the way through. I've been looking at his legislation. He's never let up on that either, which is wonderful. He has a lot of interest, Human Rights Caucus to Congressional Arts, but his great passion that I saw him work on all of the time was cleaning up our democracy. And to do that, he introduced HR1. We all know, you know enough about it, but I think that what uh, the Congressman is going to tell us is, is going to give us great hope for our future. He shares his, and I share this great passion for campaign finance reform, but he's also insisting that we unrig all of our elections and the way that we campaign. He stands for ethics and he stands for accountability. And when you talk about redistricting, he's for all of the things that the regular people of this country want. And he is the first one to say, this is not a Republican issue. This is not a Democratic issue. This is a nonpartisan issue. It's about the people of this country and our elections and our democracy. So I wanna say thank you very, very much for uh, agreeing to do this, Congressman Jen Sarbanes, and we're thrilled to have you here. Well, thank, thanks very much, uh, Carol. We miss you in Washington, but we know wherever you land, uh, you're doing incredible work. Uh, Carol was one of these people who came to Washington as a natural extension of her passion for serving people and reaching out and lifting folks up. So it's no surprise that uh, she's part of this call tonight. I wanna to salute Open Democracy and Olivia, thank you uh, for hosting this tonight. I know we have somebody, um, I think coming on from ECU. I see John Rao. Uh, John, thanks for all your work in this space. John, good to see you and thanks for your great work. Yeah, and we're, we're trying to carry through on all the good work that's begun um, in so many places across this country. But um, New Hampshire's always been on the forefront of this. It was a great uh, honor for me to be awarded the Granny D. Haddock uh, recognition <laughs> some years back. Um, and I've, I've been to New Hampshire and I've marched in zero degree weather with the New Hampshire Rebellion in the past. And um, I wear all of that as a badge of honor, and it's certainly been a motivator to me uh, in the work that I'm doing in Washington. Uh, Carol's kind in um, recognizing my efforts around HR1, but I can tell you that uh, in many respects, I think I was just in the right place at the right time. I had an interest in this issue 
um, long standing. Uh, but HR1 happened because in 2018, a team of reformers ran all across America in the 2018 midterms. And what was so inspiring was in 2016, we saw what happens when the cynicism and anger and frustration in the country uh, is exploited by someone like Donald Trump, who came along and said to a cynical audience that was angry, and rightly so, at Washington corruption and what they view as a rigged system. Uh, and he said to them, send me, I'll be your voice. I'll drain the swamp. I'll break furniture up there. I'll teach people a lesson. And people have become so angry that they reached for that solution. Um, but the story doesn't end there, because as I say in 18, a lot of Democratic candidates uh, reached out in these same places, and they said, we have a different way of solving your anger. We'll go to Washington, and instead of burning the place to the ground, uh, we will find a way to fix it and restore your voice in our politics and in your own democracy. And they came, and we were lucky to have a product there, to have a legislative package that they could grab and run with. And they did that. And in the first hundred days by March 8th of last year, uh, they had helped our caucus pass in the House of Representatives, the For the People Act, uh, HR1. As Carol said, and she's, she's very right about this, this isn't about left and right. It's about inside and outside. It's about people across the political spectrum uh, who look at a politics they feel that has been hijacked by special interests and sort of big money insiders. And they feel really defeated and angry and frustrated by that. But the fact that they're angry actually gives me hope because it means they still care enough about their democracy and their place in it to get angry. And it's up to us as policymakers to find a way to channel that, whether it's at the federal level with solutions like HR1, which is just a broad transformative package of democracy reforms, uh, or at the state level where we've seen tremendous uh, creativity and inspired motivation over the last few years. And I'm very pleased that New Hampshire is now stepping in um, to this space from a, a kind of structural framework standpoint, uh, very much matching all of the various component parts that we've uh, put into HR1 and frankly reflect what's uh, been bubbling in New Hampshire and other states around the country for years uh, with the leadership of people um, like Carol Shea Porter. Um, you know, you, you meet these people as you're, as you're embarked on life who you know instantaneously share your values and, and passions for for uh, these issues. And, and Carol, you know, the first time we met, I could tell uh, was somebody like that. So, um, so anyway, here we are with what we believe is a tremendous opportunity. Um, I, I, would like, I would like to believe that the, um, the kind of transformative change that we are seeking with HR1 could come out of a bipartisan corner I just don't think under current conditions that's going to happen. Not frankly because rank and file Republicans don't support a lot of these measures because the polling shows they do. And not even because there aren't members of the Republican Party in the House and the Senate who would embrace uh, most of these elements. But more so that the leaders of the Republican Party in Washington in recent years have sort of decreed to their caucuses, you shall not participate in this effort. And they've kept them off it. And that was the reason why last year, the only votes we got, it was enough votes, but the only votes we got in the House for HR1 came from the Democratic side of the aisle. So we know that that's where this effort has to start and um, that that's where we're gonna make the most initial progress. But I am very confident that if we can get a reset of the rules in place, that you will see uh, Republican lawmakers and certainly rank and file 
Republicans across the country embracing these elements. Let's talk just briefly about what they are. Um, and I will say they respond to three um, fundamental pleas on the part of the broad public. The first thing we hear if we're listening carefully, and you particularly hear it in this moment with the election looming before us from people is, just make it easier for me to register and vote in America. Make it so I don't have to run an obstacle course to get to the ballot box. Uh, so we have a lot of reforms that address that. Respect me as a voter when it comes to drawing district lines. So we have a response with a national solution to partisan gerrymandering using independent redistricting commissions. The second thing they say to us is when you get to Washington, just behave yourselves, be ethical, be accountable, be transparent. Remember who sent you there. So we have a whole series of reforms on the ethics front, dealing with conflicts of interest, um, code of ethics for not just the legislative branch and the executive branch, but for the judicial branch as well. And the third thing they've been saying to us for years is don't get tangled up in the money. You know, we sent you there, continue to work for us. Don't let the lobbyists sidetrack you, don't get hijacked and taken hostage by the big money folks, represent us. And the fact of the matter is, it can be hard to do that because money has found a way to capture so much of how Washington operates, but we can break free of that influence. And we have very robust measures in HR1, including a small donor matching system to fund congressional campaigns modeled after a lot of what's happening across the country and what New Hampshire itself is very interested in uh, to lift up candidates. What does that do? It empowers everyday citizens because they feel like, hey, we're the ones calling the shots, not the deep pocketed political class, donor class. Uh, and the second thing it does, and this is super important, and all the polling shows this is in fact what, what the public responds to most. It makes it possible for people to run for office and become candidates who right now can't do it. They don't have deep pockets themselves. They don't know people with money. They can't raise what it takes to run a competitive race for Congress. But if you set up a small donor matching system, you immediately empower much more diversity in terms of access to that candidate pool. And the public can see themselves in those representatives. And I think this is what uh, makes so many people interested in this kind of a, of a system. So that's it. Let us get to the ballot box. Behave yourselves in Washington. Don't get tangled up in the money. Our effort to respond to that reasonable set of demands resulted in a 750 page bill <laughs> called called Where the People Act. But if we could get this done, it could really transform things and begin to build back trust with the American people. And the last comment I'll make is, we know that all the other things we wanna see happen in this country, fair tax policy, action on the climate crisis, responding to gun violence, um, dealing with the high costs of prescription drugs, Progress on all those things right now is being blocked by the influence of big money in our politics and on the way we govern. So if we could reset the rules, if we could bring everyday Americans back into their democracy, instead of having them with their noses pressed up against the glass now, watching as a bunch of insiders and lobbyists call the shots, we could get all those other things that Americans so desperately want to see. So. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, I'll yield back my time, Olivia, and we can we can proceed with the rest of the program. Thanks for that opportunity. Do uh, we have questions for uh, Rick Hubbard is in the chat with the first question, but I'll just let Rick unmute himself and ask his question. Am I unmuted? You're there. 
let me uh, start my video. I've been hiding. All right. uh, hello, John, and thank you. Uh, I sent the question out so everybody can look at it. Uh, HR1 would be a huge advance forward if passed. I mean, we could improve on it, but it's a huge step. And I think everybody would agree. But my question goes to the commitment that underlies it. Uh, and it's easier to sign on to a bill when you know that it's a good thing and it's popular with citizens, but that it's going to be blocked in the Senate. And the question is, if it actually were passed, it would be hugely beneficial to citizens and it would help us to um, incentivize Congress to put the broad public interest ahead of narrower special interests and provide better, if not proper representation for our interests. Uh, but on the other hand, if you did that, a more, a fairer, more competitive, uh, you know, political structure would make it harder for existing senators and representatives to hold on and remain in power. So while it's easy to sign on as a co-sponsor now, if the Democrats were actually to win the, both the House and the Senate, uh, it, my question is how committed do you think that both Nancy Pelosi in the House and Chuck Schumer in the Senate, assuming they were still the leaders, are going to be in actually getting this passed into law. You know, it was HR1, the first one, but how deep is that commitment? How really important is it when push comes to shove? And secondly, how important is it to the various present co-signers? Or is there gonna be fall off when push comes to shove? It's a great question. It's the question because you're absolutely right. Um, it's one thing when it's not going anywhere. It's another thing when, in a sense, you're playing with live ammunition because there's actually a prospect that it will become law. We're very mindful of that. Last year, while we had broad commitment from across the whole Democratic caucus, not just, by the way, on the House side where we actually voted it, but on the Senate side where every Democratic senator co-sponsored it. So in a sense, from AOC on one side to you know, mansion on the other side of the Democratic caucus and party, everyone embraced HR1. But as you point out, McConnell was never going to let it come to the floor of the Senate. And certainly Donald Trump was not going to sign it into law. Um, now, we built it very carefully. We built it in a way that we think uh, meets the equities of everyone across our caucus and includes for everyone, certain things they feel very passionately about. So for example, if you talk to Ben McAdams from Utah, um, he's motivated by the redistricting reform component of this. By keeping it together as an interlocking package, we think that increases our chances of keeping the entire caucus behind it because they all recognize that there's something in there in many instances many things in there uh, that are resonant in their district that they themselves are passionate about. So that's one component of it. Uh, in terms of leadership, I can tell you without fear of contradiction that Nancy Pelosi is a thousand percent committed to this. For starters, to make it HR1 after Democrats were eight years in a minority, you can imagine what the competition for what the first bill was going to be uh, when we came in in 19 and she made the decision this was going to be it. I think it reflects her core. She understands, even though she's someone who raises hundreds of millions of dollars for elections, she understands the corrosive impact of money and she fundamentally wants to change the system. So her leadership on this, um, I think, uh, is is uh, very intense and sustained. I think that Senator Schumer has over the last year uh, really come to see the power of this anti-corruption message. He's definitely seeing it in these races that are being run by Democratic challengers across the country because they're all leaning in 
to the corporate PAC free pledge and into the anti-corruption frame in much the same way, I might add, that the class of 18 did and then came right off the campaign trail and became the leading edge of the push for this in our caucus on the House side. So we anticipate if we get the Senate back, we'll be doing it with reformers who will come uh, with the same, projecting a similar appetite for this kind of thing. So Schumer has also talked about this as being a first order item and he articulates it as uh, HR1. Um, the, the Biden team, I think, understands the, the potential power of this as an early mm -hmm. initiative because it can be unifying um, for our party and frankly for the country. There's nothing in HR1 that polls at less than 75% across the country. To do that, you not only need Democratic support, but you have to have independents and Republicans as well um, who back it. Um, having said all this, <laughs> it's disruptive. And the danger always is that when one gets power back, the, the impulse is to say order has been restored. We do not need to go make all these dramatic changes. Um, and I fear that potential because I know how human nature is and the, the tendency to think, well, we'll manage things better and more honestly than the crowd before us. That would misperceive how deeply angry the public has become at the whole system. And I think we need to be disruptive to ourselves uh, in order to meet the public where they are in terms of their expectations of the kind of reform we need to see. When my colleagues say to me, there's a lot of stuff in here that's pretty disruptive, you know, makes me, makes me a little nervous, makes me a little queasy. I say, look, pick your disruption. Look who's in the White House right now. And part of the reason he's there is because we didn't self-disrupt earlier. We didn't make the changes the public wanted to see. And they, they finally reached the end of their tether and they said, okay, we'll show you. We'll go get that guy um, and send him to Washington. So I think it's good policy. I think it's good politics. We're going to make that case as strongly as we can. And let's face it, the fact that we did get it passed and that we got every Democrat to co-sponsor it gives us a little bit of a running start. And so what I say to people is three things. We got to keep it together. Don't start tinkering around with it. We got to keep it strong and we got to keep it moving. In my mind, the HR1 bag is packed. It's by the front door. And if we win this trifecta that gives us the opportunity, we have to grab it and go. And that's what I'm committed to. And I think we have a lot of people um, in, in our caucus that have that similar commitment. So is it going to be hard? It will be the hardest thing we ever do. Um, can it happen? I would have told you what we did on March 8th of, of last year was impossible if you'd asked me two years ago, but we did it. So we're climbing Mount Everest. The gale force winds are blowing, but we're not going to give up until we reach the summit. Oh, thank you. That was inspiring. Uh, the next question is from Christine. She just wants you to speak a little bit of the relationship of HR1 and Citizens United. Sure. So um, the Citizens United case, of course, uh, was this case that opened the floodgates, as you all know, more than 10 years ago on um, huge corporate and other you know, billionaire money coming into our politics, uh, much of it coming in in a hidden fashion. I think fundamentally demoralizing to the broad public. Uh, this is when you really started to see the anger and cynicism set in because people were sitting there in their kitchens and they're looking up at the television and they're just seeing, you know, millions of dollars of negative ads and other attacks coming at them uh, with these sort of shadowy sources of money behind them. And the average person is sitting there thinking, how do I compete with this? and just feeling like their power in a democracy, the most 
you know, the most Kratos, uh, you know, government of the people, but saying this isn't a government of the people. This is a government of special interest and big money. So it was very demoralizing. Um, that decision by the Supreme Court, obviously, I fundamentally disagree with either the idea that corporations are people um, or that money is speech in all instances. And they put those two ideas together, as Tiffany Muller of N Citizens United often says, uh, two really bad ideas. They put them together and they came up with the Citizens United ruling. Ultimately, to have the ability to uh, regulate money and politics completely, um, we've got to change the Constitution to address the First Amendment jurisprudence that the court put in place that undergirds that decision. But in the meantime, many of the reforms in the campaign finance space that are included in HR1 do a lot to push back against that decision. So broad disclosure, enhanced transparency on where the money comes from. But frankly, this idea of empowering small donors with matching funds to step up and compete with the big money. To me, this is the most um, inspiring piece of it because, because it's kind of the biggest power move. It's, it's people that have been sitting in the bleachers, forced to sit there um, in the bleachers of their own democracy, kind of watching big money players on the field um, saying, you know, we're going to get on the field ourselves and we're going to be players and we're going to push back uh, and we're going to lift up candidates on our shoulders and not be intimidated by the Koch brothers or anybody else. So we can, we can begin to implement a sort of broad political culture antidote to what's grown up since Citizens United. Now, having said all that, I support a constitutional amendment. It's a hard thing to get done. I think we keep pushing for it. We have language in HR 1, which indicates support for the constitutional amendment. We couldn't actually put that kind of vote into HR 1 because it's a different kind of vehicle. But we make a strong statement in support of that because ultimately overcoming the effects of that ruling should include that kind of effort. But there's so much we can do in the meantime, as I say, to assert the power um, and importance and the role of everyday Americans in their own democracy. And I think HR1 is a huge step forward in achieving that. Great, so other questions can um, go into the chat if folks will oh, here, Dan Weeks. Uh, Dan, do you wanna right, go ahead and un unmute yourself and ask the question, Dan? Uh, sure. Good afternoon. Good evening, Congressman. Thank you so much for um, joining this. It's, it's terrific always to hear from you. Um, you know, this is a familiar question, which I know you've grappled with over many years, um, kind of differentiating and, and getting this issue prioritized um, with the attention it deserves. But particularly in a case like this, when we're dealing with multiple crises from COVID to, of course, the continuing climate crisis and the economic challenges, um, you know, how can we ensure that Biden, if elected, um, actually puts this at the top of his agenda and the Congress likewise, if we hopefully get a Democratic House and Senate, um, so that we don't lose another opportunity? You know, when you describe this as Mount Everest, which I fully agree with, um, it, it can't really succeed unless it gets pretty much top billing uh, for a new administration in Congress. And there's so much burning urgency around these other kitchen table issues. Um, just give us the tools, remind us how you frame this, how you sell it as, mm -hmm. as the kind of unifying challenge um, that, that needs to go first. Right. So it's a great question. Let me say, um, first off, a, a meaningful package of relief and assistance to the American people of the kind we've been pushing over the last three months in the form of the first HEROES bill and then the second one that we introduced um, recently. That takes priority over everything. So I put that in a separate basket. The question then becomes, um, aside from that, uh, which is you can view as kind of an emergency response to the situation we're in from a health standpoint and economic standpoint, what should be the sequence of 
legislative initiatives that we lead with. And there, I think we can make a very strong argument that is being received, um, you know, on all fronts that HR1 should be that piece of legislation. As I say, Speaker Pelosi is committed to it. The fact that we got it as HR1 in round one last year, you can't overstate how important that was because it's at least psychically part of the um, perspective of our caucus. And it's, it's gotten, you know, a certain amount of socialization out there in the press and other way, otherwise. Um, so that was important. Um, I do think that the reform class of 18 and what I'm expecting will be reinforcements coming on the House side and then a reform majority maker class on the Senate side is very attuned to this idea that uh, they have to follow through on what they view as a bargain that's being made with the electorate, which is we are going to find a way to break down the doors of this corrupt system and get your voice back into the mix. And there's high sensitivity uh, in the House, for example, that if we don't follow through, if given the opportunity, um, then we're just creating, you know, political challenges for ourselves um, in the future as soon as 2022. So there's a political um, imperative operating here in addition to just, you know, the good sound policy dimension uh, of it. So I'm optimistic that in the House and Senate, we've, we've built... Um, a pretty strong uh, coalition of members and then a whole set of groups across the country that are uh, leaning in on HR1 that we can keep it as a first priority item. In terms of uh, a President Biden and, and Vice President Harris, we have been working with their team to put in front of them what we think is very compelling polling data that shows that Americans have a deep and abiding appetite to see this change. Um, we've shown them the power of it in those places across the country where people become most uh, kind of angry and disillusioned, particularly those pivot counties that went twice for Barack Obama and then turned around and voted for Donald Trump in 2016, which is simply evidence of how this issue resonates across the political spectrum. The reason to point that out to, to Biden is that I do believe he, he wants to quickly um, present something that has a unifying dimension to it. And this is one of the few issues that Democrats could bring forward in the early days that would both be unifying and at the same time, bold and transformative. There aren't many things like that available that are ready to go. And I think that's a huge selling point for the For the People Act, for HR1. It's certainly the case we're making. And I think there's, um, I think they are receptive to that argument. So yeah, there's a million other things coming at people and certainly meeting people's needs in this moment with the pandemic and the economic fallout take number one priority. But what's interesting, Dan, is that you can, you can find the threads of these reform issues even in this moment with the pandemic. Um, we've seen the upheaval it produced on the voting front many of the frustrations people are having right now about getting to the ballot box would have been fixed if HR1 had actually become law last year, addressing um, a lot of these voter suppression tactics, making it easier for people to register, um, making sure there's no excuse absentee ballot uh, voting everywhere in the country, insisting on a certain minimum number of early voting days, allowing same day registration, um, protecting us against foreign interference uh, that's and foreign attacks on our election infrastructure. That's part of HR1. So all of those things in this moment when people are struggling just to get to the ballot, it's reinforced as a priority. 
Secondly, um, the polls show, and I've been in conversation with my constituents about this, high anxiety that as relief money is going out the door, this is taxpayer money, there are insiders who are grabbing it, who are at the top of the economic food chain and using their influence uh, to take money off the top that should be finding its way to everyday Americans out there. This was one of the critiques of the PPP program, the small business program. In its first iteration and first round, you had big businesses grabbing this and it wasn't finding its way to the smallest businesses. So this concern that people have that insiders um, are, and lobbyists are figuring out a way to grab a piece of the pie that they don't deserve, which is the global perspective they've had for years, unfortunately gets reinforced in this moment when people have the greatest need. So I think what we're presenting in terms of the reforms, whether that's transparency and ethics, um, overcoming conflicts of interest, diminishing the money of the, the influence of big money or strengthening voting reforms, those are not dissonant at all with the perspective people are bringing in this moment in the middle of the pandemic, they're very aligned. And I think as long as we are, we, we show humility and respect in how we present those issues in this larger context, um, people will respond to it. So we're gonna make all those arguments to, to a, a Biden presidency, and we're gonna continue to push hard uh, with our allies in the House and Senate and try to get this done. Great. Well, thank you so much, Annette. We appreciate all of uh, your work at the federal level to pass HR1. We participated in the tweet storm today for Democracy Day 1. Um, but my question for you is, is what advice do you have for us as a state reform group to push public funding at the state level, to push independent redistricting, disclosure, all of the reforms that we want in the HR1 package. Um, how do we help push those at the state level too to advance the national agenda? I think them working not just at the national level, but um, working with a lot of state initiatives around the country. Um, the most important thing is to have a very, uh, is to listen very carefully to, to the people in your state and to understand what their frustrations are um, and how best to present this set of reforms so that it's being responsive to those grievances. I think the elements you've chosen and they're very much uh, consistent with the elements that we've identified at the national level um, do reflect the, the key concerns and grievances that people have. Um, but sort of teasing that out more and making sure that your message frame um, is as tight and focused on exactly what people's concerns are and what their hopes are in this kind of reform is critical. The second thing I think is really important um, is to make it clear that you're not in the wilderness on this that this kind of change is happening all across the country, that you're part of a, um, a peer group of states and jurisdictions that are making these changes and that it's making a difference. I mean, you can point when you talk about, um, you know, public financing and small donor matching systems, there's plenty of evidence now that um, in states and jurisdictions where this has been implemented, the candidate pool diversifies very quickly. You start um, electing a different group of people to state legislatures or you know, county councils, um, and it reflects better the communities that those people come from, but it also results um, in, in more people-centered legislation. I mean, Connecticut showed this very quickly after they implemented their system of public financing back in the day um, in terms of the kinds of legislation that started passing that have been stuck for years because the people that were in office um, were too beholden to a, a set of uh, special interests. So I think it's really important to put what you're doing in a broader context because that gives people 
uh, hope that this um, can actually happen. Um, and then I think um, pointing out that increasingly there are elected officials that are leading on this because what I've discovered with our efforts in Washington is that if I can say to uh, someone who's skeptical about our ability to achieve this, um, it, it's not enough for that person to say, you know, John Doe over there is leading the charge on this because their perception is there's no way one person or a handful of people can overcome this culture and, and really match what the, the big money crowd can deploy. But if you can, if you can say, as we now can say at the federal level, by pointing to a set of advocates and others that are stepping in, look, um, it's not just a handful of people. There's a whole team and they're hanging together in the storm and they can make this happen. Then people get much more uh, excited and hopeful that you can actually get it done. And um, the fact that there are now more than 60 members of Congress who are corporate PAC free, when before January of 2019, there were only about six or seven, um, I was proud. I've, I've been PAC free, completely PAC free for 10 years. I think I'm the longest serving PAC free member of Congress, maybe in American history. I don't know. Um, but now that there's more than 60, that starts to suggest that the culture is changing and people find that very hopeful. So the more you can direct people to the idea that, look, this is happening across the country. We can be part of it. Here's why it makes a difference. Um, I think the more successful you can be. It actually reminds me of this story. Um, when I came to march across New Hampshire, back whenever it was, the years run together now, but um, Larry Lessig was on that march, of course. And um, that night, I think we were at the law school in Concord, if I'm not mistaken. And there was a forum on the issue. And I remember that um, Larry showcased or unveiled a poll that had recently been done. And um, according to the poll, 96% uh, of Americans thought that money in politics was a problem. Uh, but 91% felt like there was nothing we could do about it. So what was funny is that uh, Lessig was obsessed with who are the 4% who don't think it's a problem. <laughs> and, you know, as we were kind of marching along the road, you would, you know, go into a field and, you know, ask a farmer standing there, are you part of the 4%? He said, not me, I'm with you. Um, so he, he wanted to know who, who are those 4% who don't think money in politics is a problem. I, on the other hand, was quite struck by the fact that there were 5% apparently who thought we could do something about it. That made me very hopeful. And, um, and I figured if you can start with that, who knows where you can go. And I told that story when I was campaigning for the honest elections uh, referendum in Maine for two or three days. And I remember that the director there got all excited and he said, well, Maybe if we win this referendum in Maine, that 5% will go to 7 or 8%. And then I told that story when I was in Seattle and they were getting their system of democracy vouchers in place. And the director out there said, well, maybe if we win here, the 8 or 9% he's talking about could go to 10 or 12%. Well, we won both of those referenda. And I think it started to communicate to people, this can happen. Like, it is incredibly hard. But there's no reason at the end of the day why 300 plus million Americans can't find a way to have more power and say in their democracy than two brothers named Koch and a bunch of deep-pocketed money insiders. That's the contest here. And I think we're going to win it ultimately. And, you know, this election is going to be a big part of it. So those are some of the the tips I would share with you as you're doing this at, at the state level. 
Yeah, and that seven percent that thought it was possible back back in fifteen when that poll was taken. I saw a recent poll that now it's like 50% of people think that these reforms are possible. So yeah, we're, we're getting go. ground even in five years. Right. So, so thank you so much. And I'd like to turn it over to Jeff Taylor from End Citizens United and Let America Vote. Uh, thank you, Olivia. And thank you, Congressman Sarbanes, for joining us in New Hampshire uh, tonight. We're really happy to have this conversation as we're in the heart of election season, but looking forward to the next legislative session and all of the wonderful work that we'll be able to uh, hopefully, knock on wood, get accomplished uh, come come 2021, both at the federal level, but also right here in New Hampshire, because we've uh, we've always had so many you know key uh, key ways that citizens can get involved in our democracy, whether that's our same day registration on election day, whether that's our citizen legislature, um, but really continuing to open that up so everyone can run for office and it starts to look more like the state and the country um, and just you know making sure our democracy is as accessible to everybody. I do want to give uh, a quick shout out to uh, Representative uh, Peg Higgins, who I see on the call today, uh, as well as uh, candidate for office, Aaron Spencer. Uh, if I missed anyone who's running this year, uh, forgive me. I know there's candidates all over the place and they're easy to, to slip by, um, but we're gonna have a great, uh, a great group of people come come 2021 in office here in New Hampshire that will help take this fight uh, that you are leading so well down in Washington, uh, right here in New Hampshire. And, you know, all the activists on this call are going to help help lead that effort as well. Thank you. I don't think we've seen any other questions, but I just want to sort of ask one more, sh one more Chance, if there's a question you have for the congressman to go ahead and raise your hand or, oh, I think I hear John Rouse speak in here. John, I just need you to unmute. Oh. John, you're muted. Congressman, woman, Cheryl, Carol Shearporter, do you want to take it? I, I did. Thank you. I just want to say thank you so much. It was really exciting, John, to hear how many people are now saying no to the corporate PAC money. And I think you're absolutely right that as we build this and people get more hopeful, more people will join this movement. So I want to thank you for sticking with it, because I know that over the years, you know, it's a, it's been a struggle, to put it mildly, in the House and elsewhere in Washington, because the money just just float over like sewage. So you're doing a great job and we are so grateful you're there. And also I need to say something about John Rao. John Rao, you're something else. Thank you for- Well, your, I just figured like, out how to <laughs> unmute. At the age of 88, I must say, I have a little more problems than some of you younger. But John, I just wanted to say, as I reflect back uh, over the years and where we are today, in a way we're blessed in terms of this movement that the great majority of the public understands our democracy is at risk. And uh, I don't need to build that paragraph for you, but uh, it's just exciting. And I think your optimism is dead right. And it's time to get it done. And you've made a tremendous progress. Well, John, thank you very much for all your work. You've inspired me uh, over the years. There's so many people that have been part of this uh, team for so long right. and um i think all those efforts uh could be redeemed uh pretty quickly um if everything if everything hits right here um i also just want to say that uh if you think about it the thing that the thing that cynicism about our own government does uh, which is dangerous is it makes us more vulnerable to those outside our country um, that want to undermine our democracy. It's easier for Vladimir Putin to come in and sow discord and spread disinformation if we are already in a place of not trusting our own institutions. So one of the things we achieve if we begin to restore that trust is we become more resilient 
as a democracy. And that again, allows us to lead in a way that we can't do right now. So it really comes down to how do you lift up that person out there who's, who's feeling kind of like they've been sidelined in their own democracy. And I'll come back to the thing I said right at the beginning. Um, the fact that people are still angry is what's going to save us. Because um, if they'd gotten so beaten down and so convinced the system couldn't change that they stopped being angry and they were just completely resigned to it, our work would be much harder. But that anger out there at the system shows people, shows that people care about the system. They want it back. They're deeply offended by what's happened to their own democracy and politics. And the challenge is, where do you take that anger? How do you challenge it? How do you make it um, a force for kind of restorative justice, if you will? And the way you do that is you, you find these reforms that reflect what the public wants to see. Um, and I will tell you that as we put together HR1, we were guided like the North Star at every turn um, by being able to answer or not when it came to particular provision. If we put this in there, does that help people see themselves in this legislation? And if the answer was yes, then it belonged there. And if it wasn't yes, then it was just a talking point and we tried to, we tried to remove it. This is about responding to the public's desire to get back into their own democracy. And we have a real opportunity here. If everything hits right electorally in four weeks, we got to move fast because the other side that doesn't want to see this, and the other side is not Republicans. The other side is Mitch McConnell and a group that has built a power structure over decades to keep down the voices of everyday Americans out there. Um, they are going, they know this is existential for the system they've put together. And um, they're gonna throw everything they have at it. And like I said before, we just gotta link arms, put our head down and keep marching. Up the and I think if we do that, we can be successful. So thank you all for your interest. Thank you for what you're pulling together in New Hampshire. It's amazing stuff. And every time you do this at the state level, you're lifting up our efforts at the national level because it's the same people, the same people who vote and get involved in state elections and local elections are the same ones that vote and get involved in federal elections. It's not like we have two different universes of voters out there. They're the same people and they have rightful expectations in both places. We need to meet that expectation at the state level and absolutely we have to meet it at the federal level. So keep up the great work. Well, th thank you so much for your inspiration and optimism. Um, we are going to keep fighting here at, in New Hampshire. Brian just put in the chat for those interested in participating in our weekly democracy team meetings to help advance our honest elections and clean government here locally, but also to lift, lift up the work that John and others are doing at this the federal level uh, with HR1. Um, we would love to have you be part of our team. Um, for those who can make a modest contribution to this democracy reform agenda, uh, we, we would accept that. You can make a contribution at Open Democracy NH um, to help us continue this fight ahead, as well as many other groups that are in this uh, co large coalition to move uh, these reforms because th these reforms are possible. So thank you. We're, together we will fix our democracy. I'm a late comer, but I'd like to ask a question. Um, I, I've sort of, I'm putting off uh, because I'm working on 
the upcoming election, uh, trying to connect with uh, representus.org. Are you group, is your group related or work in conjunction with that organization? Uh, so represent us is a national organization and yep. um, we have worked with them. I, they have a small New Hampshire chapter that's starting to get a, um, off the ground that we've, we've worked with as well. So it seems to be you, you have both that both organizations have the same ultimate goal. Mm -hmm. So it would make sense to join forces. Yep. And so, so doesn't end Citizens United and let America vote and a uh, common cause. And there's about 140 or so other groups that are fighting this fight. So we're we, have a, we actually have a coalition at the national level called the Declaration for American Democracy Coalition, which is made up of all of the groups that we're mentioning and is supported by uh, state level efforts as well in terms of the network that's been built out. What's fascinating about that coalition, and it speaks to the power of these reforms, it's not just sort of traditional good government groups, it's, it's civil rights groups, it's labor groups, it's environmental groups, it's faith groups. The list goes on and on because all of these organizations have recognized that the work they're doing, the priorities they're trying to advance uh, can't happen unless we fundamentally fix this problem of big money influencing our politics and our governing. And that's why they're stepping up behind the HR1 agenda in such a forceful way. So you're right, there's a lot of people who've found each other now and are mutually reinforcing when it comes to this, this set of priorities. Great. And the question was what the name of that coalition was, and it's Declaration for American Democracy. Correct. Well, okay, thank you all. I'm gonna, all. I'm gonna jump off. This was <laughs> terrific. I really appreciate it. Carol, thanks for the invitation. Olivia, thanks for hosting us. Um, and to all of you, thanks for your great work. Great, and maybe we can do a quick round of applause. <laughs> Thank you everyone so much.